This is EWA Radio, the official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. In New York City, two boys living just 15 blocks apart were struggling in public school classrooms with similarly challenging learning disabilities. They were both eligible to enroll in private education on the taxpayer's dime. But as a new investigation by journalists with the Teacher Project revealed, the financial status and systemic savvy of the boys' families played a big role in whether they got the help they needed. Joining us now is Mike Elson Rooney. He's now with the New York Daily News. He was part of the team behind this story, which was co-published with USA Today. Mike, welcome to EWA Radio. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start at the top. What is the Teacher Project for those in our audience who may not be familiar? So the Teacher Project is a fellowship at Columbia Journalism School for recent graduates of the program to spend a year or more doing deep dive national education reporting. Under the editing and and leadership of Sarah Carr, we had a little newsroom there and we would do kind of deep dive stories across the country and partner with publications to run the stories. How did the team come up with this particular story? All credit for the original idea goes to Sarah here. And this was something she had heard about through her travels. And particularly in New York, I think there is kind of conversation about these private placements and some confusion and some kind of chatter about who's actually really getting them and and whether it's happening equitably. And so we'd seen some one-off sporadic reporting on that over the years, but no real kind of systematic look at this program and who was benefiting from it. So the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act has been around a long time. It was passed in 1975. It guarantees children with learning disabilities what is quoted as a free and appropriate education. That's not always the case of what kids get, and often money is a factor. Talk to us a little bit about what this private placement safety net is and how it's carrying out in New York. This was written into the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA. And it's quite clear in the law that if a student is not being properly accommodated in their district, which can happen and and does happen often, their parents have the right to find them placement at a a private school that can accommodate their disabilities and get financial compensation from the district to make that happen. So in New York, there's really a whole kind of sector of private schools for kids with disabilities that's sprung up over, over years. And it's come to serve a pretty large group of students who are not finding success in New York City classrooms, some of which are for more kind of unique or or severe or challenging disabilities. Others are, you know, for more common disabilities, but these schools offer a particular type of methodology or, or pedagogy that parents are not finding in the public schools. So I'll be honest, I mean, certainly we know that New York City is the biggest school system in the United States. It has over a million kids. It's massive. But reading that number in your story that the city spent almost $800 million in one recent school year paying for private school tuition for kids with disabilities, Mike, that number blew me away. It's pretty unfathomable. And, you know, it's getting some increasing attention in New York. But I think for many years, that knowledge about this kind of sector has been confined to parents who are going through it and hasn't really emerged into the public consciousness as much. But I think one piece of information to help understand why that sector has grown so large is that by the city's own admission, more than 15% of special education students in the public schools are not getting at least some of the services that they're legally required to get through their IEPs. And so, you know, this is a big, complicated, systemic issue. There's over 200,000 students with disabilities in the New York City public schools, and it's a massive system that's had many years of its own struggles, and a lot of parents have kind of sought an alternative. 
But there really is sort of a multi-pronged thing happening here. So first, you have to have a kid with a disability. Two, you have to have a public school that can't serve him. Three, you have to have the parents who know about this protection to take advantage of it. And then four, you have to have a private school that can take them. Yeah, there's a lot of contingency. There's a lot of things that have to happen. There have been some ways in which this has been streamlined for families. And, you know, we don't get into that a ton in the story. Mayor de Blasio, when he took office, was pretty clear that he wanted to have a less kind of adversarial approach towards families who are seeking private placement than his predecessor, Michael Bloomberg, who was widely known as being pretty aggressive about litigating these disputes and and challenging families' ability to secure private placement. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily gotten easier for families. I think the, the city is so overburdened with these cases now that lots of other problems have sprung up. I mean, you still need a lawyer often. You still need this expensive neuropsychological exam. It can still take years for lawsuits to wind their way through this really overburdened system in New York. So there's been some efforts to kind of streamline this for families, but it's not necessarily translating on the ground. You found two boys to profile in your piece, one coming from each of these sort of extreme examples of these experiences. One is Isaac. He's from a very affluent family. And then Landon, who's living in public housing with his family, whose mother really just seems overwhelmed by this entire situation and underinformed, not through any fault of her own, about what these opportunities are. How did you find these boys? I found them through kind of separate avenues. Isaac's mom, Debbie, I saw her testifying at a city council hearing on special education and delays in this very system. And she was, you know, really articulate and passionate advocate for kids, particularly kids with dyslexia, like her son, Isaac. And she spoke really eloquently about her own struggles navigating this system, even as a, a parent with some privilege. But the other thing that caught my eye about her was that she was very self-aware about the ways in which her her privilege, her relative affluence had kind of cushioned this process for her in a way that it may not have for other families. And so immediately I thought, you know, this is somebody who can speak, number one, to a kind of very personal, intimate experience with her own kid, but can also step back and and look at some of the broader ways that the system has kind of created unequal access. And then how did you find Landon? That was a slightly harder find. Uh, So there are some groups in New York City that are specifically working with lower income families to help navigate this process. And I knew that one of those groups might be helpful and Advocates for Children does a lot of pro bono legal work with families who are seeking special education services for their kids. And so I asked them if they had any clients who'd be willing to talk to me. They put me in touch with Yolanda. And immediately I was struck by, again, like Debbie, how open and vulnerable she was about the struggle that this has been for her and her son, Landon. By the point I reached her, she was aware of the ways in which her lack of financial resources compared to some of the other families navigating this process had constrained her choices in some ways. And so that also kind of gave an opening for her to talk about some of the ways in which this system is potentially biased against lower income families. What was your approach to talking with the families and explaining to them how their children would essentially become, for the purposes of this story, the poster kids for this unfair system? That's never a simple conversation. I think you never want to kind of make a kid a symbol for something in a way that undermines their individual story. I think one thing that was helpful here was for Debbie being very clear that this is not going to be a story about families with more financial means kind of gaming the system. And I think there's been some of that framing that's happened over the years in in stories about this phenomenon. And that's really just not what we saw necessarily. And 
being clear that we're recognizing that this process is really difficult for everybody, emotionally, logistically, financially, and that we're going to really honor that and be kind of true to that in the narrative, while also making clear that it's just exponentially harder for kids coming from families with less money and less savvy. And I think both of the families, they felt like that was the truth. And so they were willing to kind of speak to that while also trusting that we were going to be fair to their individual experiences and, and struggles. And, and that took some time and, and trust building. We're talking with education reporter Mike Elson Rooney about an investigation by the Teacher Project into how private school placements are working and maybe not working for students in New York City's public schools. Don't miss an episode of EWA Radio. You never have to. You can find us on your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Your support and feedback are helping us grow. Mike, we've talked some about what you found in this project. I also want to talk about how you did it. There were two other teacher project fellows working with you. Tell us about them. My colleagues, Sharon Luria and Ashley Okosa, and I all, along with Sarah, our editor, did some of this preliminary research where we reached out to all 50 state education departments to see, number one, if they kept track of kids who were in private schools at public expense, and number two, if they had any kinds of demographic breakdowns of you know which students were in private placements and who was kind of benefiting from this system. So that took months, and we decided that we were going to try to work with the communications offices in these state education agencies rather than go through a FOIL request and potentially kind of have open end for even longer. We basically just asked. We had you know, a formulaic thing that we were asking for, and eventually 17 states got back to us with data that was usable that you know, had a, a number of students and had some kind of demographic breakdown of who was in private placements. Definitely here, this is an example where having sort of a national average doesn't really provide a lot of contact, especially for some local reporters who might want to follow your lead. You found a wide range of differences among states and communities. Tell us a little bit about what you did see, though, in terms of the numbers. Coastal states and states that had the largest cities also tended to have the largest numbers of kids in private placement. California and New York by far had the largest numbers of states that we heard back from. These are places where there's been kind of a critical mass of private schools that have sprung up, critical mass of lawyers who can help represent families to navigate the system, and other kind of related parts of, of how this process works. Some states, Michigan and Nevada, reported less than five students in the whole state in private placement. And there's a number of questions still about what exactly these states are reporting. Even New York, for example, the data that they gave us did not include families who unilaterally placed their kids in private schools and then subsequently sued for reimbursement, like Debbie. So you start to think if that data is included, and those families tend to be the the wealthiest and the most able to front tuition themselves, that could skew the numbers even further. So there's a lot of holes still and questions about what we found. But I think this was a start and a way to kind of get the ball rolling and, and help, you know, even more people investigate this phenomenon. What's been the response to the story so far? Who have you heard from? I've gotten a lot of feedback. I would honestly say more feedback than anything I've ever written, mostly from people in New York. And I think this article struck a nerve both in the disability community more broadly, but particularly in the dyslexia community. There's been a lot of advocacy in recent months and years on behalf of students with dyslexia. I think this story kind of spoke to some of the struggles that, that those people have gone through. I've heard a lot from people who say that this kind of Byzantine, challenging, often obscure system that they have to go through that, you know, that they're glad to see it kind of laid out in one place, which was gratifying for me as, as a reporter. And I've heard from families too, who say that they felt that the framing we had of a wealthier family versus a lower income family can also leave out some families more in the middle. 
which, you know, I think is part of the story here too. And certainly don't mean to imply that there are only two paths through the system. I think there's a whole kind of spectrum of experiences that people are having. I'll tell you what stuck with me with the story, Mike, is I felt like it was a really powerful reminder about how much untapped potential there is in little kids. And, you know, both of these boys were diagnosed and and there was a problem recognized fairly early. And fortunately, they've both gotten some of the help that they needed to achieve. We spent a lot of time talking about test scores and how to measure what kids are learning or knowing. And I think sometimes it's just great for a reporter to go back and say, how much of school is just sort of helping kids unlock who they might be able to become? And I just thought that really came through in your story. I think that's really true. And a piece that stuck with me too is that for these two kids to get the help that they did need, a lot of things had to fall into place. And both of them, for example, tested as both dyslexic and with an above average IQ. And those kinds of test results help shape the kinds of placements that kids can get in private schools. And so, you know, what happens if you don't have an above average IQ? And, you know, what happens if you have a history of more serious behavior issues? And and that kind of further and further limits the number and quality of schools that you're looking at. At every step of the process, by income level, by disability type, by you know behavior history, the options constrict and constrict and constrict. And it's kind of daunting to think about what happens for kids who are at the very kind of extreme of that spectrum. If I'm a local reporter, Mike, and I call you up and I want some advice on how to follow this story, how to localize it for my audience, where do I start? So first thing I would say is reach out to your state agency, ask them, number one, if they track the number of kids in private placement, and number two, if they have any kind of demographic breakdown of who is getting private placement. If you work in a large district, you could also try your local education agency and start to dig into some of those numbers of schools. If you see schools with a population that's really skewed in one direction or another, Take a look at that. Um, We found that these schools can often be just as segregated, if not more so, than the local public schools. The other thing is just not to assume that these schools are necessarily going to be a better alternative. We've heard from a lot of people who say that they feel like there should be more scrutiny of what's happening in some of these private schools. And so those are all kind of avenues that you can take on this story. So, Mike, what is next in this ongoing series for the Teacher Project? We have a couple more stories coming out that look at other aspects of this private placement phenomenon. My colleague Sharon Luria is looking at the use of restraints and seclusions in private schools. And we've seen more and more reporting about restraints and seclusions in all settings for kids with disabilities. But This is a look at what happens in schools that are often less regulated or monitored than public schools. Our friend Joe Hong, an education reporter in California, is also looking at some of the ways that restraints and seclusions have played out, particularly in California private schools. And my colleague Ashley Okosa is looking at how this process works for Latino families in New Jersey and some of the specific barriers that they're facing. We look forward to the entire series, Mike. You're relatively new to the education beat. What do you like about it so far? I love the combination of big kind of systemic issues that involve a lot of data and sociology and also just the great kind of small intimate moments you can get with kids. I think those are great answers, Mike, and we welcome you to the beat. Mike Elson Rooney is an education reporter now with the New York Daily News, who is part of the Teacher Project team behind this investigation. He joined us from his office in New York City. Mike, thanks again for making time for EWA Radio. Thanks, Emily. And that wraps up another episode for us. If there's a story you want to learn more about, drop us a line, word radio at ewa.org. The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For more than 70 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Have a great week, and thank you for listening.